All right, I think we can get started. I know some more people will be will be joining us, but uh, I want to make sure Dr. Kobayashi has plenty of time for his talk. So um, we have a very special guest today um, coming to us all the way from Tokyo um, through the magic of Zoom. Um, Dr. Masaki Kobayashi is uh, a geriatric medicine research fellow in Japan at the National Hospital Organization Tokyo Medical Center. Um, he's currently um, doing research in polypharmacy and dementia management. Um, he is trained in internal medicine and geriatric medicine in Japan and has five years um, of experience working as a geriatric medicine attending physician. Um, and what he's gonna, and he's also been the director of their polypharmacy management service, dementia care service, and dysphagia and swallow swallowing services. So has been very busy. Um, and he's gonna share with us some of the work he's done related to communication skills, which is really fascinating and innovative. And I'm really glad that he's um, taking the time to talk to us today. Um, I met him a few months back and we, we talked and I was just so very interested in all of the work that he's doing and was hoping he would share it with us and also give us a little bit of insight into what it's like to practice geriatric medicine in Japan. So thank you so much, Dr. Kobayashi, for joining us at one o'clock in the morning um, to give this <laughs> talk. And uh, you can go ahead and, um, and get started. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Dr. Bennett. Um, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. It's a great honor to be here. So I'm Masaki Kobayashi from Tokyo Medical Center, Japan. So I'm going to talk about geriatric medicine in Japan, focusing on multimodal comprehensive care communication skills training in geriatric medicine and analyzed by artificial intelligence. So I will introduce myself. Uh, so I've been a clinician for 14 years and after clinical training of general internal medicine and geriatric medicine, I was attending physician for five years. I'm currently working as a geriatric research fellow in Japan. So I have no uh, financial disclosure. So this is a Mount Fuji. <laughs> the Mount Fuji is the highest mountain in Japan. <laughs> so the learning objects are to understand the cultural differences between geriatric medicine in the United States and Japan, and to understand how the lack of communication skill training for caregivers adversely affects dementia care, and to understand the concept of multimodal comprehensive care methodology, QMONI2. So I'm going to talk about geriatric medicine in Japan. So Japan has highest life expectancy in the world at nearly 87 years for women, 81 years for men. So as you can see here, Japan has been super aging society. By 2050, 40% of Japanese population will be aged 65 years and older. Here are the population pyramids of Japan and the United States in 2020. When you compare these two, you can see that the Japanese society is aging more rapidly than the United States. And the elderly population in Japan is more than twice of the young population. And the birth rate is 1.3 in Japan. On the other hand, the birth rate in the United States is 1.7. And this is a total health expenditure. That as of 2020, healthcare expenditures in Japan were 11% of the GDP compared to approximately 17% for the United States. So I'm concerned about that in the future, Japan will be challenged to keep healthcare expenditures 
as low as possible and still pay for its aging society because a few younger workers contribute to the cover of the healthcare system. So let me explain about Japanese healthcare system. So Japanese healthcare system have mainly universal health insurance and is based on free access. And the long-term care insurance system provides social assistance for older adults who need support or nursing home care. So um, Japanese universal health insurance system provides relative equality of access. So all Japanese people are required by the law to have health insurance coverage. People without insurance from employers can participate in the national health insurance program. So as you can see, the approximately 40% of population in the United States receive public health coverage. So this is the number of doctor consultations per person. In the United States, people may need to consult their family physician first to obtain a referral to see a specialist or a subspecialist. But in Japan, people can visit any private clinic, hospital, university hospital without referrals. So as you can see, the number of doctor consultations in Japan is three times more than in the United States. And then this is a time that doctors spend with the patients during the consultation. As a result of healthcare system differences between Japan and the United States, as you can see, the physicians in the United States spend more time with the patient than in Japan. So Japanese physicians sometimes need to see patients with no appointment. So when I wasn't attending, I sometimes saw about 40 patients over three hours in the outpatient setting. And this is the length of hospital stay in acute care settings. So once Japanese patients are hospitalized, they generally stay at the hospital longer compared to the United States. A condition that requires an overnight surgery such as uh, um, appendectomy in the United States, maybe a week of hospitalization in Japan. And the Japan has a community-based integrated care system that the Japanese government proposed. In the system, families, peer res residents, and the volunteers are encouraged to provide care for elderly relatives with mild disabilities. People with severe diseases or disabilities are encouraged to receive care at home from visiting medical and welfare professionals while using medical and welfare facilities only occasionally. The community-based integrated care system provides not only acute care and long-term care, but also all social services in a seamless manner in accordance with patient's need. And a geriatric medicine in Japan is recognized as a subspecialty in 1988. There are currently about 6,500 members of Japan Geriatric Society but only 1,500 board certified members. So in other words, one geriatrician for every 24,300 older adults in Japan. On the other hand, one geriatrician for every 7,700 older adults in the United States. And so many physicians in Japan, except for pediatricians, need to be geriatricizing. And out of 82 medical schools in Japan, only 30 schools have the development of geriatrics. And geriatrics as a specialty in Japan is predominantly research-based. And 
And then during my clinical experience, I often encountered elderly patients struggling with polypharmacy issues. In Japan, national health insurance allows patients unrestricted access to all hospitals and clinics. Moreover, many patients have access to and make use of multiple pharmacies, since acute care hospitals and primary care and specialty clinics have their preferred pharmacies built next to them. And particularly for elderly patients with multimorbidity, each provider may not know what other providers have prescribed for the patient. So it is a responsibility of patients and their caregivers to manage their list of medications. So in order to address this significant issue, so when I was attending, we created a new service called the Prepharmacy Management Service out of a hospital. The service is to manage polypharmacy and inappropriate medication use for hospitalized elderly patients. My other clinical interest is dysphagia and the swallowing issues for older adults. When I was an attending, I worked with other healthcare professionals, including dentists and dental hygienists, nurses, dietitians, pharmacists, rehabilitation staff. We assess the swallowing function, provided oral care, and consider appropriate food based on patient's need and the patient's swallowing function. And my other big interest is dementia care. So before moving on, I will introduce national sports in Japan. <laughs> um, Sumo has a long history of 1,500 years. Two wrestlers enter 15 front foot diameter ring. So many people in Japan, especially older adults, <laughs> like watching Sumo matches on TV. And this is Judo. Judo is a famous martial art around the world and is originated from Japan. And as you know, so, uh, black belt is at top of the belt system. And this is a kendo. Kendo is a traditional Japanese martial art. Kendo uses a bamboo sword and armor, which is used to protect the body from strikes. So when I was a junior high school and a high school student, I played a kendo. So I like kendo because the important aspects of kendo are um, manners and etiquette toward other players and opponents rather than simply winning or losing. Okay, so next um, I'm going to talk about multimodal comprehensive care communication skill training program in genetic medicine. So this is the estimated prevalence of dementia per 1,000 population. These are prevalence of dementia in 2015. Um, so these triangles are estimated prevalence of dementia in 2035. According to the estimate for the number of people with dementia in member nation of the OECD report, that both the prevalence of dementia and its future rate of growth in Japan are highest among these nations. And as you can see here, in 2035, the number of people with dementia in Japan can be increased by two times compared with the United States. And in super aging society, older people with dementia struggle to interact smoothly with their caregivers. Through my clinical experience, I sometimes struggle in caring for a patient with dementia who refused care. And then we could not provide medical care and medical treatment properly for them. So I, we believe that communication skills training 
in caring for patients with dementia, for healthcare professionals and family caregivers, it's becoming increasingly important in modern society. So as you know, effective communication is a fundamental element to ensure the provision of quality of care. In contrast, communication that is fragmented or interrupted may impact negatively on patient functioning, comfort, and safety. However, there's a still lack of evidence regarding educational interventions to improve communication in the most important care settings in which people with dementia are cared for, such as acute care. So when I was wondering how best we could communicate with patients with dementia, I watched a video that made a great impact on me when I first watched the video. I will show you the typical case that medical staff struggle to care for patients in Japan. This is a video about a 94-year-old man with hip fracture who refused oral care. This is what happens in his usual care. お掃除します。お口の中。あーって So this is the following day of the video where the fourth nurse provided oral care for him. And after the care, his son made a comment about the care. Uh, Good. Oh, so as you can see, his reaction changed dramatically after delivering care of the NARS. So can you tell the difference? So the nurse in the second video used multimodal comprehensive care communication skills, which is called humanitude. Humanitude refers to a concept proposed in 1979 by Mr. Ives Genest and Ms. Rosette Mariscotti, who are French physical education teachers. It has been used at over 600 hospitals and nursing homes across Europe. And my mentor, Dr. Miwako Honda, who trained in geriatrics at the Cornell University, brought humanitude to Japan about 10 years ago. And humanitude involved multimodal comprehensive care communication skills, and it emphasizes the development of good relationship 
between caregivers and care receivers. It also respects the human liberty, autonomy, and dignity of those who receive care. So please let me explain multimodal comprehensive care communication skills. So this method focuses on four, element, four, four elements of communication with patients. Face-to-face -face interaction, verbal communication, touch interaction, and the assistance of standing up. So multimodal comprehensive means that the caregivers should always use at least two out of three modes of communication at the same time, face-to-face -face interaction, verbal communication, and a touch interaction. So let me explain each communication skill. So eye contact is a core element in the humanity. The object of eye contact is to help patients continue to pay attention to caregivers since patients are easily distracted by other stimulation such other individuals or objects. In humanity, these efforts to preserve continuous eye contact can lead to smoother interaction with patients with dementia. And other elements are geometric, geometric and temporal characteristics in face-to-face -face interaction. Humanitude points out the importance of geometric properties when caregivers make eye contact with patient with dementia. The impression perceived by patient with dementia depends on how the eye contact is made. When eye contact is established from the front and the, at the same eye level, it creates a positive impression. Eye contact from the side of the face without directly looking at the patient's eye level or from above creates a negative impression. And the humanity would also discuss the distance between caregivers and the patients during eye contact. The closer distance creates intimacy and trust in patients with dementia. The humanity recommends an eye contact distance that is closer than the distance generally observed in adult communication, such as around 20 or 30 centimeter, about two fists around like this. And the next verbal communication. So phonetic information includes tone, speed, and volume. Patients with dementia have sometimes difficulty in understanding the meaning of linguistic information. However, their amygdala essentially analyzes emotional meaning of paralinguistic information. Their hearing loss is the highest preparation attributable factor for dementia. People taking care of patients with dementia have a tendency to speak loud and high pitch voice to communicate. These tones convey negative emotional prosody to patients. So to avoid this condition, you might should recommend to calm, slow, gentle, and low voice. And another category of verbal communication is vocabulary. Vocabulary is critical to convey positive information. To establish good relationships with patients, selecting positive words is key. The, for example, by adding a positive emphasis, thank you very much for keeping your mouth open. That is a big help. And the touching plays an important role in a communication with patients. Touch interaction is an opportunity for communication to develop good relationships. A person brings a positive or a negative meaning to another, depending on the kind of touch or how it is performed. A friendly attitude and intimate relationship must be maintained before and during the touching. 
because touching behavior may influence on a person's privacy, such as changing diapers or potentially invasive medical procedures. For this reason, humanitude determines the techniques how to touch patients with dementia in the care. So I will introduce uh, how to approach for touch. So aggressive touches are never acceptable and must be avoided. Necessary touch must be made as comfortable as possible. For example, to avoid conveying negative information, caregivers should not approach the arm of a patients with grabbing from above. They should approach their arms to support from below. And the touch place is a very important. And the tactile stimulation are received by the brain's somatosensory cortex. As you can see here, the size of a receptive area depends on the body part. The area corresponding to the hands, face, and the mouth is large. The area corresponding to the legs and arms is small. So even if we touch a person in the same way, the effect on care receiver's brain will be different depending on which part was touched. Therefore, to avoid startling a patient with dementia by suddenly receiving too much information, caregivers should first touch the parts that convey less information, which are the upper arms, shoulders, and bark. And the sensitive areas should only be touched when absolutely necessary, the hands, the face, and the genital region. And then let me explain about the assistance of standing nap. So as you know, uh, we have to pay attention to the harmful effect of prolonged bed rest on older adults. The amount of information from peripheral, uh, peripheral receptors about the position and the perception is more in upright than supine. The patient with cognitive decline showed significantly more arousal and awareness in the upright position that Ben read them. The main goal the humanitude is to maintain the health of all their adults and allow them to live a life with dignity by helping them stand and walk. And another goal is to accumulate the duration of standing up 20 minutes per day to prevent being bedridden. In fact, humanitude offers many techniques that provide working assistance. The key is letting all their doubts stand and work by themselves to maximize their muscle strengths. During the standing up and working assistance, the caregiver should always use more than two out of three modes of communication elements. As I said before, face-to-face -face interaction, verbal communication, and touch interactions to present the consistence and the positive stimulation. Uh, these are Japanese uh, tempo, castle, and a five-story pagoda. So these are incredible, beautiful. So please come visit Japan when you have a chance. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so I will introduce your uh, clinical effects of humanitude program. So we conducted clinical trials evaluating the efficacy of humanitude program for healthcare workers and family caregivers. First, we worked on research about the effect of humanitude program for nurses on both delirium and the physical restraint in intensive care unit. Our study showed that the incidence of delirium significantly decreased by 80%, and the use of physical restraint significantly decreased to half. And next, 
we conducted research about the effect of the humanitude program on all healthcare professionals' empathy for patients with dementia. As I showed the previous video about the patient with hip fracture, patients with dementia often refuse oral care. So our study showed that oral healthcare professionals' empathy scores were increased post-training, and the training improved the oral health of patients with dementia. So we consider that the patients accepted oral care because of an increase in oral healthcare professionals' empathy, which led to the decreased refusal of oral care. And we conducted research about the effect of humanitude program for family caregivers of people with dementia at home. So our study showed that care burden of family caregivers was significantly decreased post training. And the behavior and the psychological symptoms of people with dementia significantly improved after three months. And this is a data about a psychotropic drug prescription in patients with dementia at nursing homes in France. The psychotropic drugs were almost never prescribed for residents in the institution using humanitude methods. And interestingly enough, the disease severities and the care need levels among residents of the institution with humanitude were a national average in France. So our clinical trial results showed that we were able to achieve better clinical outcomes by using humanitude methods for healthcare professionals and family caregivers. We've analyzed the reason why humanitude contributes to better clinical outcomes. So we are currently working on research, collaborating with physicians, informatics specialists, and the psychologists. This project is funded by the Japanese government. The grant was awarded in the amount, in the amount of 3.2 million US dollars over five years. In order to understand the humanitude methods, our team is working on two approaches. Computational approach to analyze physical behavior of caregivers and neuroscientific approach to know how and why you monitor the methods work. And our team's goal is to analyze communication and to develop reproduction methods of communication. So at first, we recorded videos about what happens in caregiver's care and then we measure the interaction and the communication of the care. The researchers also annotate the interaction and the communication such as eye contact, verbal, touch. And based on the annotation, we developed an automatic evaluation system that analyzes caregiver's behavior and the communication by artificial intelligence. In terms of touch interaction, we are currently collecting the data about the touch interaction between caregiver receivers and well-trained humanitude instructors. And then we are, develop we are developing technology in order to be implemented robot. At present, it is limited to the act of touching the back, but we developed a robot movement to the extent that humans cannot recognize the difference between the case where a person touches and the, case, and the case where the robot touches. So I will introduce the evaluation system that analyzes care receivers behavior and the communication by artificial intelligence. So we developed a video analyzing system for physician behavior in acute care hospital. So we worked on research about the efficacy of humanitude program for physicians and analyzed their behavior. So we analyzed the amount of each communication and multimodal communication when they did physical exams 
for a simulated patient. Now, this is a comparison before and after training. And this is a first person camera of the doctor's point of view. And this is a simulated patient's point of view. And these are the bar's eye view of the third person camera. So let's see the, what happened before the training. So before the training, as you can see here, the most of uh, the patient's point of view only showed the ceiling. So let's see what happened after the training. So before the training, the doctor's face does not appear in the patient's point of view camera. After the training, as you can see that you can now see the doctor's face. So this is a timeline showing the lengths of each communication that occurred for one of the physicians. The timelines were mapped for all the physicians and were calculated each communication. So as you can see that each communication attached verbal eye contact after training increased compared with the before training. So based on the timeline, the length of each communication was increased post training. Furthermore, multimodal, uh, multimodal communication, which is at least two out of three components of communication was significantly increased by roughly three times after humanitude program. So we found that we can analyze each communication using artificial intelligence, and also that physicians can use multimodal communication through training. And our, another goal is to develop education system of communication skills and to contribute to society. Based on the clinical data, we developed education system of humanity. The aim of these systems is to provide basic skill training to improve patient care for students, medical professionals, and the family caregivers. So I will introduce the three education systems. So first, um, we created education system by using a video lecture for physicians. I will show you a part of the video lecture about eye contact that humanity offered.柳井さん、ちょっと診察、胸の時はしてくださいね。先生、ちょっと後ろの方に耳遠いんです。あ、そうなんですね。じゃ、柳井さん、ちょっと胸の時聞きますね。吸って。そうです、そうです。吐いて
でえっと、耳元で普通の声量でお話しするのと視線を捉えるのを交互で行いますで昇進しているときにあの耳元で話せないときにはミラーリングを使ってあのやってほしいことをお伝えすることもできます、はい、柳さんちょっと胸の音聞かせていただきますね先生うちの主人ちょっと耳が遠いんですあそうなんですねありがとうございます柳さんそしたら胸の音聞かせていただきますねありがとうございます。よく聞こえました。So、we provided video lectures about the concept and the method of human magnitude for physicians in acute care hospital. In addition, we provided bedside training with human magnitude instructors for physicians. And then let me explain about the second education system by using an iPad. This is an online coaching system that was developed. As a care education system for family caregivers at home. First, family caregivers received on site training and learned how to use an iPad. And next, they recorded care for people with dementia on the iPad at home. And then they sent the video to their instructors and received the feedback. And finally, family caregivers reviewed the feedback video. And practice the care at home. And this is a video showing the instructor's advice for family caregivers by using an iPad.、Um, and she,、uh, she has a dementia, and she's our hot daughter and a family caregiver. And he's a well trained humanitarian instructor. So let's see the video. I'm going to 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 see the video. あのよく見れることがありますどうするかというとここの角のここにちょっと座ってもらうのちょっと試してもらうと面白いかもしれないここに座ってもらって横からこう見るとぐるーっと見ようとするよりも横からこうやってこう,こう首をこうやって出すだけで見やすくなったりするんじゃないかな。So, as you can see, the feedback is easy to understand for family caregivers. And I think that this system would be helpful for family caregivers. And the third education system is a simulated communication training using augmented reality with real time feedback. During a face to face interaction, eye contact and distance and axis of the face are evaluated. If there is no face to face interaction or verbal communication in 10 seconds, the warning starts, such as a no communication, no communication. So, touch interaction is evaluated by sensor gloves. So, virtual patients react based on the participants' interaction. So let's see the video. No communication. こんにちは。こんにちは。こんにちは。<笑> We are currently working on clinical trial about this simulation training using augmented reality system for nursing students. No 
So in 2017, uh, Fukuoka City, which is the fifth largest city of Japan, launched the 100 project as a sustainable social model for anyone and everyone to live a full life in good health. The Manichul is selected as one of the main projects. In Fukuoka City, the Manichul skills training program is provided for family caregivers, medical professionals, EMS, and civil servants. And the Humanitude Skill Training Program is included in the curriculum for five medical schools in Japan. At Okayama University, they recently published a research article about the efficacy of Humanitude Program on improving empathy of medical students. And then we are currently working on research through international collaboration the France, Singapore, Korea, and UCSF, that we plan to do a clinical trial of a humanitarian skill training program for Japanese American family caregivers collaborating with UCSF. So um, please apply the humanitarian method that I introduce you uh, in your daily patient encounter. And then also that please use at least two out of three modes of communication at the same time, face-to-face -face interaction, verbal communication, and attach interaction. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. That was just fantastic. Um, I felt like I was listening to like a keynote talk at a national conference. Uh, it, was, it was just really wonderful to hear all of that. Um, it looks like we have some time for questions if you're all right with taking some questions. This is, this is Wayne McCormick. Thanks so much, Masaki. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> and, uh, I'm I'm having I'm having a deja vu though. Do, do, is there a, a word for deja vu in Japanese? Do you know deja vu? Yes, I know yeah. deja vu. A <laughs> feeling like you've been somewhere before, like like a dreamlike feeling. I I was in Tokyo about 25 years ago and had mm -hmm. terrible jet lag and flew in and had to give a talk at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, jumped out of bed and raced down into the street in my suit. And it was 3 a.m. I had miscalculated my time change. So I, I had this weird out of body experience that I, I bet you're feeling right now <laughs> being one or two o'clock in the morning there, but it's tomorrow. So that's peculiar. Anyway, wonderful talk, Masaki. And oh, thank you. The humanitude concept really resonates here. It's striking how uh, homogeneous care is um, across the world these days because there's so much communication like you're delivering this morning. So uh, thank you so much. And your slide of sushi here is making me hungry for lunch already. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, the most favorite food among Japanese older adults <laughs> is sushi. <laughs> so it's a very, uh, the, uh, good interaction and a good communication between caregivers and the care receivers is very important in medicine and then and uh, also uh, except for medicine so daily life <laughs> i i was wondering it's it seems that a lot of the components that are core to humanitude are more challenging during the pandemic when people are wearing masks and distancing. Yes, yes. Um, and I was just wondering how you found that to impact the work you're doing and what solutions you might have found that you could share with us. Um, thank you for, uh, this is a great question. So it's a little bit um, difficult. So, um, but uh, as I introduced uh, the remote coaching system, it, uh, the remote coaching system is a very um, the unique and very helpful for family caregivers. And also the 
I think the healthcare professionals. So the, the COVID-19 is, uh, uh, is uh, difficult to interact. And uh, so because uh, social distance is needed uh, because of the pandemic, as you mentioned before. So the uh, remote coaching system of communications training the, is uh, useful, I think. And then, and then, so, and then, as you mentioned before, the masks uh, is uh, needed in the medicine, that acute care, a long-term care, uh, outpatient settings. However, the um, so eye contact and the verbal communication and touch interaction is uh, so can be uh, used uh, without uh, with mask. So the uh, you monitor the method. Uh, so so anyone can learn to monitor the method. So that um, so that's why the even if the pandemic it is it, it has been pandemic. So the you monitor the method is very useful, I believe. Saki, I had another question at the beginning. You're talking you mentioned the poly pharmacy. Uh, yes. In the U.S., pharmacies are correct or connected electronically, so they can kind of see what other pharmacies have delivered mm -hmm. to patients. Yeah. I would think that would be even more sophisticated in Japan than it is here in the U.S. But can pharmacies see what other pharmacies have prescribed or or uh, dispensed uh, to patients in Japan? Sorry, could you repeat that, please? Sorry. Yeah, here in the U.S. Uh, one pharmacy can see what another pharmacy has <laughs> prescribed for a patient who's coming to them to have their medicine dispensed. Uh, so multiple pharmacies have a, a method of at least seeing what our other pharmacies have dispensed and avoiding redispensing a particular medicine. Uh, but it sounds like that is not as easily done in Japan. Are pharmacies connected electronically in a way that they can see what other pharmacies have dispensed to a patient? Oh, yeah, this is a great question. So the pharmacy the system uh, is a huge difference between United States and the Japan, I think. So the uh, pharmacies uh, the, don't have a uh, connection, uh, electronic data for each patient. So that's why uh, the mm, the pharmacies uh, the pharmacies and each provider don't know about medication for the patient. So that's why the sometimes I saw a patient with this uh, same medications. <laughs> so yeah. So that's why the. Mm, I think deep prescribing intervention is very important. However, the in Japanese medical system, so it's a little bit difficult to do deep prescribing intervention in outpatient settings. So that's why the uh, in acute care settings, the 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 um, we so I we come up with the uh, the idea the deep prescribing intervention in acute care settings. Then yes. Thank you. I mean, domo arigato. <laughs> arigato. Uh, David, you had a question. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, I am I am wondering. Uh, early on, you mentioned uh, delirium and. Thinking about the application of the humanitude method in people with delirium, I am wondering if uh, your studies have focused uh, on measures of delirium, some measure of agitation, for example, and whether this method can reduce agitation in people with delirium. Um, so this study is just evaluated the delirium. So the um, 
I think the the outcome, clinical outcome of a communication skills training is a little bit difficult to um, so the but uh, the delirium is related multiple factor. So then then especially in intensive care unit, the so the uh, many um, the um, intervention such as IV, the uh, physical restraint, and then something like that. So, so that's why the um, the I think the it's very important to um, reduce the uh, um, the. Sorry, uh, how can I say uh, to reduce the uh, the um, the uh, strong so strong intervention so so um, th that's why so I think the non pharmacological non pharmacological intervention is very useful the delirium in the intensive care unit so um, and I understand in the United States health program is a very useful for delirium, but uh, I think the, in Japan, it's a little bit difficult to do the health program. So that's why the humanitude is, uh, humanitude method is useful for uh, healthcare professionals uh, technique. So that's why the, um, the, 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 um, the old nurses or world uh, the old nurses in the world then the acquire the humanitude method so the uh, the, the 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 so the the, the sorry and the, the intervention the is a very useful for um the earlier in intensive care unit so yeah thank you <laughs> Well, I don't know if you can see everything that everyone's writing in the chat, but you're getting lots and lots of really uh, grateful comments. Lots of thanks oh, for your presentation. And thank you very much. We really appreciate you taking the time to, um, to share what it's like to practice geriatric medicine in Japan mm -hmm. and to share your work. Um, I, I think all of us learned a lot today and, um, and just you're doing wonderful things so thank you for doing that oh, and sharing uh, i really appreciate this opportunity so please contact me if you're interested in humanitude uh, i can tell you more about humanitude and the geriatric medicine in japan so thank you so much i have a question well just a one more question will you be joining us at ags in um yes orlando oh will be will you be talking about this at the American um, in, in yeah, Orlando. I, I, I'm an American Geriatric Medicine member. And will you be coming to the meeting in Orlando in May of 2022? It, uh, COVID. Next year? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I will, yeah, submit the uh, abstract, the 2000, uh, 2022. Okay. Oh, we look forward to seeing you there then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Assuming we we are, we are allowed to travel. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you so very much. Yeah, thank you so um, much. And thanks, everyone. I hope uh, if I don't see all of you that you have wonderful holidays. Um, so take care, everybody. Thank you very much.